In this video, we're going to explore the charismatic movement. This is a movement within the church uh, post 1960s. Very specifically, this is focused on uh, section E of the uh, RS Educas syllabus, uh, religious identity through religious experience. Focus of the syllabus then is the main beliefs uh, within the charismatic movement and then the implications for Christian practice in the experience of believers and Christian communities. And then uh, look at philosophical challenges to um, that charismatic experience. Let's go back to this overview slide, which uh, reminds us of just the whole process that we're looking at as the uh, church moves from the splits, uh, Great Schism, uh, roughly a thousand, um, 1500 uh, Reformation, and then all that fragmentation in the Protestant church. And all that started then towards the end of the 19th century to see a, a reverse trend. And then through the 20th century uh, is the uh, period that we're looking at. And this section here on uh, religious experience and we're focusing on the uh, the charismatic movement within this. Uh, this is uh, one of these bottom up elements. And so what we've got, if we think about this, you've got these individual Christians who have this uh, religious experience, this charismatic experience, which leads them to, uh, to worship, uh, to be a Christian in a particular way. And what that does is that unites them very closely with other people who've also had that charismatic experience and are living and worshipping uh, as Christians in a particular way. And that uh, unity of the uh, charismatic experience uh, transcends denominational boundaries. And so what you find is that these, uh, these individuals, uh, they will gather together at a big, I don't know what you really call them, festivals, gatherings, uh, some of them are huge. They will take over an entire Butlins holiday camp for three weeks. There'll be thousands of people there. They'll take over uh, showgrounds. There'll be some of it might be camping. Um, and there'll be thousands of people there. There'll be uh, teachers on the, uh, in the main stages and in, in, in smaller groups. And, and those teachers will have that charismatic experience. But denominationally, they will be from uh, lots of different denominations and the person that you're worshipping with in, in one of those uh, big events, uh, the person that's the person standing next to you, the people you you uh, listen to during the week, the people you discuss with, the people who are uh, next in the next tent to you or the next chalet to you. Uh, they could be from completely different denomination, but you are united in this uh, religious experience. And then how that works, as, as we've looked at this, those individuals who've had that, uh, well, some of them are, in fact, um, leaders within the institutional churches. And so that moves us back up to that D level. And so those people in the institutional church who've had that charismatic experience are pretty keen then uh, to bring together the denominations because they see that their denominational label uh, is less important than their uh, th th their experiential level of Christianity. And so then you, you get that top down uh, where they are facilitating uh, work between denominations uh, because denominations have ceased to matter. Now, it's also worth putting a rider in at this point uh, that this is predominantly uh, a move within Protestantism. Uh, there is some a crossover between uh, the, the charismatic movement in Roman Catholicism and Protestants, uh, but certainly the, the, the charismatic movement has been a profoundly uniting influence uh, in the, the Protestant tradition, rendering denominations um, all but irrelevant within uh, that particular um, strand of, of, of Christianity, uh, that charismatic uh, revival. Let's look then at a key biblical passage. This is from uh, St Paul and he talks about gifts of the spirit and that's what a lot of the focus of the charismatic movement is about. It's about what are seen as God, the Holy Spirit, uh, in some way, language is difficult here, empowering them, filling them, uh, reviving them, 
uh, and giving them gifts, giving them a specific, uh, sometimes specific abilities and in uh, other aspects of it are just um, manifestations of the spirit. Uh, so this is Paul talking, uh, writing to this, uh, the, Corin the church in Corinth. Uh, so in the middle of the first century here. So this uh, this charismatic stuff is I mean, certainly not new. Um, and here is Paul talking about it um, in this letter. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. Now, some of those in this list are uh, fairly straightforward. Um, the um, faith is pretty straightforward, uh, but others are more uh, miraculous. Uh, working of miracles is specifically uh, labelled there. Uh, and this prophecy, discernment of spirits, uh, speaking in various kinds of tongues, uh, an interpretation of tongues. So these are the more um, sort of weird um, supernatural type gifts. And it tends to be those which have um, taken prominence in the charismatic movement. And one of the problems in studying the charismatic movement is that it's not uh, it's not primarily intellectual at all. It's experiential. And so it's, it's very much a, you start with the existential and then you um, work out some theology uh, that seems to explain the exist that existential experience. Now, of course, if you've never been uh, in one of these um, charismatic services. Uh, in fact, you may not have any idea what they are. It's a bit difficult uh, to just try and look at it theoretically. Uh, so what we're going to do now is um, just point you in the direction of some um, some ways of trying to get it into what um, this mo modern charismatic uh, worship, charismatic experience, charismatic churchmanship uh, is all about. Um, Modern music is a key element to it. It's a sort of most of it's a sort of light rock genre and um, Hillsong is um, uh, it's, it's more than a band. It's um, it, it's a sort of it's a music ministry is probably how it would be uh, described. And uh, this watching some of these uh, videos, loads of them on YouTube uh, will give you a flavour of what uh, it's like. Um, a lot of the, the, the charismatic movement um, is about these big events. And so you've got thousands of people, great light show, music. Um, and so watch some of these. Uh, there's, um, you can either just check out Hillsong Worship channel on YouTube, um, and I'll put some links in the, um, in the description uh, below where you can just check out uh, what they are like. And there's lots of them, uh, but Hillsong are a um, very good, very polished uh, music ministry. And you get a feel of what some of those big uh, charismatic events are like. Of course, most charismatic worship is not in those huge events. People uh, like to um, go to those. So if you're, in a, if you're a charismatic Christian, you're probably going to a, uh, at least uh, one of those type huge events each year. Uh, but the local church uh, tries to uh, emulate that um, just on a local level, uh, Sunday by Sunday in their services. Uh, how effectively uh, they deliver that depends on the quality of, of musicianship and um, the general uh, sort of technical ability within the church. Uh, but a lot of these uh, churches, uh, they've got very strong numbers. Uh, there's lots of young, pretty savvy people. 
and there tends to be enough money. So a lot of the, even a fairly small church, uh, can, uh, um, can deliver uh, quite effectively. And very importantly uh, about the uh, crossing denominations. Now, a, a very um, dynamic church within the Church of England is Holy Trinity Brompton. Um, it could be perceived as, as the most dynamic uh, church in the Church of England and has got lots and lots of influence um, throughout uh, the church, throughout the um, UK. It's something worth looking at. Um, have a look at, um, so just look at the website. Um, there we go, www.htb.org. Now, one of the, the questions to ask as you look at the Holy Trinity Brompton website, that's the Church of England, and in fact, you can see in the graphic uh, that I've uh, put in the screen there, it's fairly obvious, it's a Church of England church. I mean, it looks like it. You can see it's got an east window. You can see the um, uh, the, uh, the arches with those uh, going into the side aisles. And if you look at it from outside, it's a standard um, London church. And outside, it just looks like an ordinary Church of England church. <clears throat> Inside, you'd probably think it doesn't look anything like your standard um, Church of England church. But have a look at, and as you're looking at that, the, the main thing to do is to say to yourself, what's the question? You know, why, do, why do people, why are people attracted to that, that sort of church? What's going on? The, the intellectual bit comes second, it's existential first, which is a major problem because uh, at the moment, what we're doing uh, is is analysing, uh, analysing this uh, at an intellectual, at a theoretical level. Uh, there's always a a problem there when you you try and just reduce the uh, experiential, the existential, and you try and just reduce it to a list of of propositional statements. Because if you're doing that, you're actually missing 95% of what's going on for the people involved, uh, which isn't about propositional statements at all. It is about uh, the existential. It's about participating in that event. It's about the uh, the relationships there it's about um it's about feelings it's about emotions and it is just about the totality of the human person living out their christian faith within community so always be aware of the dangers of reducing that to a list of propositional statements which are then going to be evaluated now speaking in tongues and singing in tongues this is a, a fairly um significant in, in some strands of the charismatic movement is pretty major um this speaking in tongues is pretty uh, pretty weird to people who've not encountered it um, and the i'm not going to try and explain it the easiest way again is just to point you to some um uh, illustrations on youtube of what this is i've put them on the screen here and i'll put them in the um in the description below i'll put these links in and again the the important thing is this is not um there's not just a sort of one size fits all and so you go from what you would probably consider to be just some pretty weird and wacky um american um the, the uh, american pentecostals who you know you might feel really really uncomfortable looking at it and then you've got justin welby you know you can't get more uh, respectable than the archbishop of canterbury who just very uh, factually very practically a uh, very ordinary fashion talks about praying in tongues so there's no um there's no one size fits all for this you've got this within the roman catholic tradition you've got it in the um the sort of you know the very traditional uh, american um fundamentalist protestant uh, you've got it in the modern charismatics we've just seen in holy trinity brompton uh, young sophisticated modern uh, londoners most of the people who go to that church uh, so it is again this is one of the things about the charismatic movement is it is it crosses all denominational lines which of course is why it's so powerful in terms of the uh, the unifying uh, within the christian church and that bringing back together of those divisions uh, and as you can see in, in the this here this is even uniting across that catholic protestant split 
Now, of course, as this is looked at and we're evaluating this and analysing it, um, then it's so, uh, well, what explanations are there for what's going, what is going on in this? Now, very important to uh, look at axioms here. If, in fact, you're approaching this as a philosophical materialist, then, in fact, you're going to look at what would be described as purely psychological explanations for it. As soon as you're not a, a philosophical materialist and you've got some sort of even minimal uh, sense that there is something beyond what we would normally call the physical, that there is some sort of a divine spirit, God, um, then that immediately opens up the idea that what might be going on here is these people are somehow encountering that uh, the spiritual, uh, the non-physical, the mysterious, something other. Uh, they're encountering that in a way that opens up ways of being uh, which aren't normally available to us, put it that way. Um, and at another level, you could say, well, this is actually with the, the standard way of, of expressing this within in Christianity. is say this is God from the outside sort of entering the person in the power of the Holy Spirit and changing them and then manifesting that change and the spirit um, speaking through, worshipping through that individual uh, using uh, this, um, uh, the, what's known as tongues, uh, glossolalia to be um, technical. We're going to have a look now at the historical developments of this. Uh, the historical developments, as we've already referenced, go back to um, the, the first century within the Christian church. And if you go back into the Old Testament within the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, you've got uh, accounts uh, in the Old Testament of, of, um, of Saul, King Saul, and the prophets and talking about them prophesying. And it's pretty obvious that they're describing something uh, that is that fits very well with uh, what you see in those um, uh, charismatic churches, those Pentecostal churches. And so it's been around, this has uh, been around thousands of years, nothing modern about it at all. We're looking particularly at the, at the modern charismatic movement and its uh, influence on unification. And so that particular strand of what we're calling the charismatic movement uh, we need to go back to the early 20th century. And of course, this is again in that period that we're really interested in. Uh, at tail end of the 19th century, uh, things began to change. And then early 20th century, and particularly in America for this bit that we're looking at, is very important. We're going to look at two characters then. And these both American. One is Charles Fox Parnham and the other it's not so much the individual, it's the church that is relevant here, which is the uh, uh, Azusa Street. And so this is no, known as the Azusa Street Revival, uh, and that's in Los Angeles. Let's start then with Charles Fox Parnham. And from him, we need to just dip back a little bit earlier uh, to give us a better context. So Fox Parnham then, you can see he's uh, he spans that uh, end of the 19th century into the 20th. He's um, described as, as independent, so he's not got a particular denominational allegiance. He's not sort of paid by a denominational body, so he's not a, a minister of the Baptist Church. He's not a minister of the Methodist Church uh, or the Church of England. He's just, um, he really just works on his own uh, Christian who has decided <clears throat> what he's going to do is an evangelist, itinerant. It means he wanders around and so he he travels around <coughs> finding people um, to teach, finding people to preach to. Uh, and churches would invite him to speak, uh, to preach at their services or their Bible studies or at church meetings. Now, the important bit here is that he is within what's known as the holiness tradition. Uh, and that is um, a tradition which uh, it feeds very much into this charismatic movement. He belonged, be, believed very strongly in divine healing, so that's that sort of charismatic gifts. And very importantly, uh, Fox Parnham is somebody who has 
uh, talking about speaking in tongues and saw that as a very important uh, element and was that is the evidence for reception of this baptism with the Holy Spirit. And the, the important thing about speaking in tongues is it's pretty weird and it's uh, quite distinct. So therefore, uh, all these other elements of the um, uh, of the sort of gifts of the spirit uh, look in many ways fairly normal. They might just be a little bit you know, slightly different to the way most people in most churches are working. But as soon as you start speaking in tongues, that really marks you out as different. So we need to look a little bit at this holiness movement uh, to see uh, how this shaped the charismatic movement. The important element in the holiness movement is this concept of second work of grace, uh, sometimes a second blessing, and that being central to being a Christian. In the context that uh, this is developing, there wasn't really any concept of somebody who was not a Christian. If you lived in Europe or America where much of this is going on then you were a Christian or you were a Jew if you lived in one of those uh, Jewish communities but they were fairly irrelevant really and so the idea here is that everybody is a Christian everybody's been baptized everybody shows up at church periodically when they get married they're going to get married in church etc the holiness movement was about saying that that's not enough. You can't just be a sort of cultural Christian. There's got to be some clear evidence of this uh, of being a Christian. And this is where the second work of grace came in. So the idea is that you are a Christian, you baptize the baby, confirmed, etc. But then at some point you're going to have, and this is the important bit, it's an existential um, element to your Christianity. You have some sort of profound experience later in life where you have a sense of meeting with God in a very real way and are profoundly changed by it. Now as the holiness movement went into the Pentecostal charismatic movement then that um, profound experience later in life which you needed to be a genuine Christian was linked very closely with speaking in tongues and so really that um, fed into the charismatic movement uh, through the Pentecostal movement with a sense of uh, yes okay you've been baptized but you have to have this <clears throat> meeting with God in a very powerful and profound way uh, changing you to an existential level and how do we know that's happened you're going to speak in tongues. And a key player in this was John Wesley. Now Wesley was uh, not merely baptised and you know sort of cultural Christian vaguely living as a Christian. No, Wesley was a, an ordained Anglican minister when he had his second blessing, that existential encounter with God. Uh, Wesley is a very key player. Uh, it was the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church. And so a pretty, a pretty significant um, pair of Church of England clergymen who um, their work then spawned the, uh, the, the Methodist Church, which has been uh, in its time a fairly significant uh, denomination. And this is how Wesley described this event. And it was an event, he dates it. Um, and he says, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. At the point that Wesley had that experience, he's uh, just in a Bible study, he's reading um, Luther. So he's reading a theology book and he encountered God. The crucial thing about this is this is not an intellectual engagement with Luther. It's not an intellectual engagement uh, with St. Paul's letter to the Romans. This is at an existential level. This is as far back as we're going to go uh, in this history but this is the uh, in many ways if you're going to have an origin of the uh, holiness movement it's the Wesleys uh, 
and this feeds on then through the 19th century and into uh, the Pentecostal movement and then into the charismatic movement. Now very significant in the um, Pentecostal uh, revival was this uh, church in Los Angeles, uh, the Azusa Street Church. And very significant, I mean, just uh, the fact that this is uh, early 20th century and it was a church which had both African-Americans and whites worshipping together. Now, if you bear in mind that it was only in 1865, at the end of the American Civil War, that slavery uh, was abolished. This is not that long uh, after uh, that. And so you've got those uh, deep divisions still there. This was segregation era. And yet uh, this was a, a church where you would go in and you would find a mixed black and white uh, congregation. So that's pretty radical for the time. Uh, these, this church was defying uh, the social and cultural and political norms uh, which were all about uh, racial segregation. Now very important, this is William Seymour who is the, uh, the minister and the services there uh, were uh, a pattern uh, that was very much then absorbed into uh, that Pentecostal tradition, no formal structure to the service. Um, people uh, preached and testified um, uh, as, and the way they would put it, as they were moved by the Spirit. And very importantly, uh, we've got this speaking and singing in tongues and also falling in the Spirit, which is a, a sort of passing out in a swoon. Um, this was uh, incredibly significant. This was a, a revival uh, is you have, uh, I'm sure you still have these missions uh, when you'll, um, for a week, they'll have a special preacher come in. Uh, there'll be, uh, they'll invite lots of people in. Uh, and usually these things last for about a week. Uh, this went on for years. And it was significant because it, uh, there were the number of people who, uh, were involved, the media noticed it, the secular media, it was presented in newspapers, um, which then meant that even more people turned up. And so what's happening here is people are arriving at the, um, at the Azusa Street Church and they're coming from all sorts of different uh, denominations, different parts of the country. They were influenced by this. They had this second blessing experience. They potentially started speaking in tongues and then they went back. And so they went back to their own churches of all sorts of different denominations and then took some of those patterns from Azusa Street back to those churches. And so that was a great way of spreading that Pentecostal model. The, the uh, incredible feature of the Pentecostal type um, services is this lack of formal structure. Just a personal anecdote. I remember the first time that I encountered this. Uh, this was Saltley Baptist Church in Birmingham, and this would have been in the um, in the seventies. And I was a lay preacher at that stage, not in the Church of England, and I um, I, I was just preaching at this church. It was just given me as a church, go and take the service at this church on Sunday morning and um, phoned up the uh, somebody from the church to get some guidance and what the hymns were, that sort of thing. And he said, yeah, he said, turn up. He said, bring a sermon, um, maybe choose a hymn and, um, you know, maybe a prayer. And I thought this is this service is going to last about 15 minutes. Uh, well, what I hadn't uh, realised was that this church, which was about 50 percent uh, black, uh, then what they'd done, the uh, the black elements in the congregation had in fact sort of converted the white people to be uh, honorary black people in church. And so this service went on for well over an hour uh, because I was close to irrelevant. Um, they they chose the hymns, they sang, they did their own praying. Um, the, the, the Bible reading that I'd chosen was read. I preached a sermon, but very um, noticeable during the sermon. Uh, it was one of those was sort of almost cliched uh, black churches where they uh, shouted out through the sermon, 
um, they shouted Amen, and um, which is quite encouraging, really, because you normally as a as a as a preacher standing in front of a congregation where you're not entirely sure whether they're awake. Um, but they still clearly were. They were not only awake, they were clearly listening and fully engaged with what I was saying. Now, that wasn't um, it wasn't quite in, as, as far down the line as uh, as the Azusa Street revival of the Pentecostals. There was no praying in tongues, but certainly in the time of prayer, instead of it just being me at reading the formal prayers that I'd written out beforehand and turned up with on a piece of paper, uh, the prayers were it was me saying we'll now have a time of prayer so it's introduced it and then the members of the congregation just got up and prayed spontaneously uh, in that and so it's quite a lengthy time so very um many ways sort of anti-clerical in many ways i was uh, i wasn't actually ordained at that stage but i was a formally qualified uh, lay preacher uh, but this lot could have quite happily got on uh, if no minister had turned up it they possibly wouldn't have even noticed and so that's that um, idea of the um, it's a, a, a declericalizing movement. Uh, it's a, a movement of the people. Uh, God is encountering people, uh, and they are able to speak um, through the Spirit. Uh, is the idea within this? And again, it's got to be understood at an existential level. It's incredibly difficult to study this movement. Uh, just as an academic exercise from the outside. We're looking at the charismatic movement in terms of its um, unification uh, of the church. And so as we look at the, um, at the strengths and weaknesses of that, uh, it's, there's two elements to it. One is its uh, profound importance in uniting Christians, going right back to that uh, slide at the beginning about that movement of the um, a bottom up movement where uh, Christians who experience that unity at these big charismatic events and the charismatic experience of being far more important than denominational allegiance uh, is clearly a profoundly uniting factor. There's a, a weakness to that, however, because there's a tendency in some areas uh, within the charismatic movement uh, that it just creates a different division uh, that um, remembering back to that uh, holiness movement concept that uh, what you can then end up with is uh, Christians who've had this second blessing who've had this uh, Pentecostal experience who are members of the charismatic movement and very particularly those who speak in tongues just then simply form another faction and so you then have got a division between those Christians that speak in tongues, uh, the, the proper Christians, and those Christians who don't speak in tongues, who are considered then to be some sort of second class citizen. Another element as we analyse the charismatic movement is what is the, the source of it. I already mentioned the fact that to uh, state the obvious depends on what your axioms are as to what the options here are. Uh, will be. So if you're uh, coming at this as a, a philosophical materialist, uh, you've got no God, spiritual, spirit, divine, you've got nothing like that at all. And therefore the only possible explanation is what we will call natural. And so therefore you do this all in terms of, of purely sociological uh, and psychological terms. Now, of course, if you are um, somebody who's willing to accept the spiritual God, um, type explanations, then in fact you've uh, got another layer here that, that doesn't remove the psychological and sociological. So there's plenty within the Christian church who uh, have done plenty of analysis of the charismatic movement and uh, that uh, psychological and sociological explanations for a lot of uh, the aspects of it is, is open uh, within that. But also, of course, uh, they've got the um, the option of saying actually what we've got here is something that God is giving uh, that uh, at least some of the people uh, experiencing this charismatic renewal are genuinely uh, expressing gifts given by God that words are given by God 
and that they have been given the power of God to perform uh, healings and other miracles. And this, of course, then uh, links us into um, what are often seen as, as separate strands of study, and that is the whole concept of miracles and the miraculous and the whole study of religious experience. And so the charismatic movement has got to be set within um, those other studies.